Hey, let's go to the phone and bring in financial Phil. Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? I am well, sir. Now, your your wife is a principal. You've got a, a daughter in the school system, Phil, so I imagine this is an interesting day at the McCoy house. Uh, yeah, the uh, school's closed, I guess, because the, the uh, uh, in, no internet, which presents, as I understand, I don't know, but as I understand, presents a lot of problems. Uh, for communications and being able to reach outside the schools. Their phones are connected to the Internet, as I understand, and so that causes lots and lots and lots of problems. Yep, no school as a result of that. Uh, we don't know anything about tomorrow yet, right? I, I don't know anything. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way. <laughs> that's right. And, Set up the segment, and, and we're in, he's on board as an advisor today. <laughs> no, I know, well, I know nothing about the schools. Although my wife is a principal, I know that there's no school today, and that she left early this morning, and that is it. That's what I know. So I'm, I am a mushroom society when it comes to uh, to the ongoings of the school. Phil, uh, we won't get a chance to talk with you before the Super Bowl on Sunday. So we've got the Eagles and the Chiefs. Who are you taking? I think the Eagles are a slight favorite. Well, you know, I, I've been going back and forth about this, and I think I'm, I think I'm taking the Eagles. I think the Eagles' team is better. If you look at the Chiefs, they got this aura around Patrick Mahomes, and it should be that guy's unbelievable. But I think the Eagles have a better team. And so, therefore, I'm going to go with the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, my heart, a little bit. I'm a Steeler fan. I only root for the Steelers. So, but the Chiefs are on the AFC side and the Eagles on the NFC side because the Steelers are on the AFC side. I normally would root for the, for the AFC side. I don't know that i got a rooting interest, but I'm taking the Eagles. I think the Eagles are going to win. I kind of agree with you. I, I think they just have a better team. Mahomes is playing on that high ankle sprain. The rest of that team looked a little bit banged up against the Bengals. I think they won that game against the Bengals out of spite because the Bengals were talking a lot of trash. They they referred to Joe Burrow as Burrowhead, Burrowhead Stadium, as, yeah. because of Arrowhead Stadium and Burrow's success there. And I think they uh, they may have psyched themselves out of a win there in Kansas City. They just shut their mouths and played the game. Yeah, I think as a whole, I just think the Eagles are better, man. I mean, those guys on every in every position, whether it's offensive line, defensive line, even receivers without Tyree Kill, other than probably tight end, I mean, you got to give the edge to the Eagles. And of course, and I don't know that anybody's better than Patrick Mahomes at quarterback, but overall, now I will say that I think the AFC is better. If you said, okay, which one, which is a better division? The AFC is better. It's much deeper. It's just better. But the best team in the league this year, I think, lies in Philadelphia. But we'll find out. Yeah, you're probably right. I think I could have looked at the AFC. I could have said Cincinnati, Kansas City, Buffalo, any of those three teams, I think, could win the Super Bowl. Right? And then you look at and the up end. Up until Lamar Jackson got hurt, you even thought that the Ravens were a Super Bowl contender with, with Lamar Jackson. They had a great defense. I just, I just don't think that. Their offense, even with Lamar Jackson, is championship caliber. I, I think it's a college, think it's it's a college offense. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think it's limited. Yep. Good. Though. Before we leave that, did you watch the Senior Bowl on Saturday, Phil? And how did uh, no uh, Bajan do? I I'm know how Bajan did. He sounded like he did well. It sounds like he did well. It sounds like he, he raised some eyebrows uh, in practice. And I, you know, I always said he's probably not going to get enough game time that would change his outcome. But what they see in practice sounds to be really impressive. So I'm excited. I'd love to see those guys from Shepard get drafted or make a team, you know, even if they don't get drafted. Because part, part of the draft is there has to be interest from more than one team. Because if you're looking at it from a standpoint of a draft pick, if you think, hey, we can pick him up as an, un, as an undrafted free agent, you're likely to do that. But even if they don't get drafted, all you got to do is make a squad, make a roster. That's it. Just get your foot in the door. And then you can really show these guys what you can do. So I'm excited for all three of them. Yeah, uh, I'm excited. Even even the you know Brown coming out was a surprise. I think to everybody, but it kind of makes sense. And he does fit the mold of today's NFL running back. You know, he he he, he catches well out of the backfield. He's fast as I'll get at. You know, you don't really recognize it until you see him running beside some defensive backs. But I think I, I, I'd love to see all three of those guys get on a roster. That would be huge. 
Yeah, uh, very quickly about uh, Bajan again. He had a good day, but he, toward the end of his stay, he threw a t- uh, an interception. Do you have any idea the nature of the interception? Was it his fault, or is they re- bounced off a receiver? Do you know anything about it? I, d- I don't. I know that, that I think his side was losing, so he was trying to make a play. I, I don't know that that would really hurt him um, in the grand scheme of things. He didn't get to practice along with those guys, so I don't think it hurts him. You get to see his – his drop back, his release, how far can he throw it, how quickly does it get out of his hand, all those things are more important than what he did during practice. But yeah. I have seen a lot of – like I've seen his name mentioned, you know, shared on social media from, you know, from, from the Shepherd fan page, but I've seen his name mentioned in a lot of outlets that weren't getting mentioned before. So kudos to him and his dad, you know, his, his, uh, <laughs> Travis, I went to college with. I mean, <laughs> that guy seems to be a, a – an a, a all-American fan favorite. He got he's quite the charisma that he he has. So so good for both of them. He needs his own show on the NFL Network, man. That that he uh, needs something, man. He's like a Pat Ma- McAfee kind of guy. He does. He has an attraction. He's you know he's a lovable, big, strong, lovable guy. It's, uh, it was it was cool to see that. A lot of charisma. They did uh, a uh, ProFootballNetwork.com did a ranking of the quarterbacks who played in the Senior Bowl. They had the Fresno State kid in there. At number one, and then Jaron Hall of BYU, number two, Max Duggan of TCU, number three, and then Tyson Bajet at number four. And it said his off script ability was also apparent as he broke contain and made several highlight reel throws on the run during practices. How quickly will he adjust to the speed of the NFL is the ultimate question. And will his decision making ever catch up with his accuracy when he's on his game as a close second? For Bajant, his ceiling is late-round pick. He's still got a long way to go to make an NFL roster from there. They had the Houston kid, Clayton Toon, number five. Malik Cunningham of Louisville was number six. And Hendon Hooker of Tennessee, uh, they have him not ranked because uh, he didn't appear in any live games or practice action. But uh, Hendon Hooker was pretty impressive for Tennessee this year. So just uh, an impartial opinion about the quarterbacks at the Senior Bowl. Are we are ready yeah, to shift? We are, we are ready to shift. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, Phil, on 60 Minutes last night, the uh, the lady in charge of IMF, International Monetary Fund, uh, was talking about the uh, the global economy and said it was not as bad as it could be. It was not good, but not quite as bad as it could be. But she went on to say that uh, that is all contingent upon the debt ceiling. If the U.S. does not pass the de- or raise the debt ceiling, uh, all better. That's off as far as global economy. Did you by chance listen to her last night, and or do you? Can you speak to that? I, well, I can speak to it. I didn't listen to her last night. You know, we had talked about the debt ceiling. I think last week as well. And right now, as far as the radar of our markets, I don't. E- either they are discounting the debt ceiling to say, "Hey, this is going to get passed." There may be some hubbub, but they're they're not going to default on their debt and and there's it's starting to become a topic even on money shows and that's of course that's where my attention goes when when i'm driving my family doesn't like it but i'm listening to money shows but it is widely thought that that it it will pass and i think our markets are assuming that it's going to pass so the only uh play one way or the other for our markets would be is if there's anxiety about it passing that could cause our markets to drop until it gets passed. And I forget the dates. I think Rob reminded me of them last time we were talking about the debt ceiling, where it didn't pass, the markets gave some money back or gave some gains back, and then it did pass, and we, we gained it all. I think that would be the extent as our markets, as far as our markets are concerned. I think that would be the extent of it with the debt ceiling. You know, it seems to me th- there comes a point where we keep moving these goalposts. We, we have debt ceilings, and then we just bust the debt ceiling. What happens if we get rid of a debt ceiling? We just, th- as a concept, because this has happened, I think, 70 times now that, that we continually <laughs> have to raise this thing. It, just, it seems so silly to, to have a thing, and then year after year after year after year, we, we just ignore the thing that we have. I asked that same question on this show years ago to Mike Carl. And the debt ceiling was put into place to make sure that we don't spend more than a certain amount, right? Well, yeah, okay. And then they raise, then they raise it whenever we do, <laughs> right? And then they set a new debt ceiling, and then we fight over it, and then we raise it again. The time to yeah, attack it, this it, is it, during it, the budgeting it, process, it, by the way. This is the, that's the time to attack this is during the budgeting process. You mean the uh, what, the omnibus bill process? Is that the as 
we haven't passed a budget in quite some time. I know. So, go ahead, Phil. No, I. I, yeah, I, I th- effectively, I, I don't think there is a debt ceiling because we, it, you know, it, 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 as it pertains to our markets anyway, it doesn't seem to matter. Whatever it is, we're just going to raise it to meet that goal. So really, does it really even exist? It's just a, it's just a concept. It's got the significance on money policy that Groundhog Day actually has on weather. <laughs> it just, it just comes up right. repeatedly, yeah. and then it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, let me let me push back a little bit on you, uh, uh, Phil. Uh, you said it's just a concept. It is a concept in one sense, but it's not a concept in a in the main sense. The Congress has to act in order to increase the debt ceiling. If they do not act, then it's a lot more than just a concept. Yeah, but they always act. You they, know, they, they always they, come to a conclusion. They always have with a lot of rhetoric and a lot of pushback one way or the other. It's, been, it's, it's used as, as leverage of trying yep. to, as they put together the, the following year budget. It's just leverage. Yes, it is. Phil, let's talk markets here today. Futures are lower. Did we get a good news is bad news moment late last week? We did, man, and it was such good. I was, I was hoping that we were through that, but that jobs number, I think we added, was it 517,000 jobs, and we expected to do like 170 or something like that. So that was one back to that narrative where maybe we, I thought I was hoping that maybe that was over. But we also have to keep in mind, people may be taking some gains as well. So that could be our impact on the markets could be a little bit overinflated. So what does that mean? So we go back to this. What does this mean? Good news is bad news. And that is good news. That means people are working and people are employed and our economy is moving. And it is a sign that we're if we are headed for a recession, it is probably further out. So it's going to push this recessionary fears further out. However, in the short term, or for 2023 anyway, what's that mean for interest rates? You know, so Jerome Powell, what he said last week, which sent our markets up sharply, I didn't didn't hear the same thing our markets heard. I heard that we're going to have to keep rates higher. We're going to increase them a quarter of a percent this time, and we're data dependent moving forward. And I think if you summed up what he said, that's what I heard. That's how I how I, I, I took it, how I accepted it, and it, it will be data dependent moving forward with what our economic data tells us, especially on the jobs front, the the PCE and the C, CPI and all these measures that we use to measure inflation to see what we're going to do moving forward. And he also said that he doesn't right now anyway foresee a pivot in 2023. And the reason he doesn't foresee a pivot in 2023 is because our jobs numbers look so good. Our employment data looks pretty good. So we're not in a recession if everybody's working, right? So that's what he said, and it sent our markets soaring for whatever reason. Now, did we just take that as, hey, we're going to pause if the data will let us pause? We're going to pause and we're going to rally because of that? Maybe. But then Friday with that jobs report, then we're fickle. We're really fickle with what our markets think as a whole. That jobs report did that then tell us, like, uh-oh, here comes another quarter of a percent at the next meeting or maybe even a half a percent or what's that going to mean for the CPI and the PPI and the PCE and all these things that the, that the Federal Reserve Board is looking at. That, that means they're going to want to increase again, so we better sell off. And we've, we've made some money, so let's be quick to do it. We've especially made some money in the last quarter of 2022 and so far in 2023. And that could just be part of that, that momentum going up. And if you're if you're – considering selling or walk away from the table a little bit, you might as well do it while you've had some earnings or made some money in the last uh, three to four months. So that, that could be part of what we're seeing right now. And it's also natural. You know, if you just look at it from a technical uh, perspective and technical just looking at the trends of the market, well, of course, you know, we've been up so much since October. We gave a little bit back in December, but January is really good. And same old story, but of course, if if we move up 10, 12, 14 percent, depending on the indice, it is natural to give some of it back. So I'm not overly concerned with what happens in a day or, or in a week. We'll, we'll get more information this week, and we'll see what his tone is, because he's speaking somewhere tomorrow. I forget where it is, but he's speaking somewhere tomorrow. So what is his verbiage on what that jobs report looks like on Friday? Does he even mention it? Uh, does he refer to it as good news or bad news? Who knows? He may not even mention it. But that's kind of what's going on right now. You know, we're giving some back from what his tone was last week based off that job report. 
Yeah. Phil, you've consistently uh, mentioned their sectors, uh, and they respond differently. Uh, the, it's not a uniform whole, but uh, sectors. Uh, we got good reports, good job market, good numbers across the board, with one exception. That's a tech uh, tech industry. Yes. And they've two percent uh, of our overall two, market. Yes. Yeah. Why have they at this point in time, or why are they moving opposite of the rest of the market? I would estimate, and I don't I don't know this, but I would estimate that they added a lot of jobs first coming out of COVID because remember how hot technology was and our perception that maybe our world would change. It did change a little bit, but maybe our world would change with the Teams meetings and the virtual meetings, and now everybody's been introduced to Amazon and cell phones that maybe wasn't introduced to it before. Um, So now these tech companies needed more employees to fulfill that, but just as quickly, some some of that uh, desire has left. You know, as we reopened this this going back out into the world in the face to face world that that we that we had we were and we're becoming again more so than what we were during the early days of COVID anyway. And now they say they don't need these employees. But we have to keep in mind, even though these companies are so large and they make up such a strong percentage of our NASDAQ and our S and P that is, that is much, in my opinion, is much more important in today's world than what the Dow is to our overall markets. That the the tech companies only make up two percent of our overall employment. So the fact that two percent is going one way, and what we saw Friday, the other ninety eight percent seems to be going another. So you're saying that uh, recently the tech market has over over expanded or expanded yes. too much too fast. Okay. Exactly. Yes, sir. What are the chances you think that we've just reached a new normal? Um, I, I've talked on this show before that my first house we bought for 13 percent on a three year arm. You know, we had to qualify, jump through hoops to get that. What year was that, John? That was 1984. 1984, and. Um, you know, we got 10, 12% pay increases every year to keep up with inflation, and life felt normal, and life became normal, and just, we just kind of march on. What is that maybe what's happening here, that yes, interest rates are much higher than they were before, but okay, you know, they just are what they are, and we're adjusting to them, and life, life moves on. Is this a new normal? We just have to get used to 7% mortgages? I think so. Uh, I think that that could be the case until there's reason. Now, the Federal Reserve is much more involved than what they used to be in trigger-happy with rates, it seems, over the last 15, 20 years or so. But if we hit another economic downturn or recession, they're very likely to go back to that toolbox to cutting rates. How long they'll stay there is the question, because I agree with you. You know, these rates that we're seeing right now, in the context of time, these are still pretty decent rates in the context of time, not in the context of the last 15 years, but in the context of time. These are still pretty decent rates. And as you, you know, everybody's got their, their stories about their first homes and so forth. And my first home came about in 2000, 1999 is when we were closing on it. And just like you had said, now it wasn't 13, 14%, but it was, I think it was six and a half percent. And I did it on an arm, uh, just like you had mentioned. So that was six and a half percent more what you're looking at right now and i still remember my father-in-law telling me you have to snag these rates these rates are really good (laughs) and you're likely to not see them again and because and and we have to remember where we we were back then that was something that he wasn't accustomed to you know when he bought his first home or whenever he borrowed money for an auto those are the, the rates that we had available to us at that time were much lower so i do think it will become more normal I would prefer us not to get back down to these super extremely low rates and that become our expectations because it's hard to get out of that. You know, you said expectations for consumers, especially new, new home buyers and and new, you know, younger kids coming out to borrow money and, you know, with rates being essentially zero, essentially, you know, you set an expectation that's hard to, to repair moving forward. So that's a hard hole to get out of. So I kind of hope that, you know, whenever we get to this point where rates are normalized and we're not moving them, that if they do cut rates, they do it at a much slower rate than what we've done in the past. And that's also to say, though, that I hope that something like a worldwide shutdown, because I'm still still not quite sure that they did the right or wrong thing back then. We'll find out. We'll see how this plays out. But when they cut rates so fast back in 2000 
and they and the uh, was that right or wrong? We're going to find out what the outcome of this. Some of it is dependent upon what they do here moving forward. The flip side of that, with the increasing rates now, is I saw a uh, thing pop up on my uh, computer at home about a certain bank offering a five percent CD for eleven months. Well, previously, if you were trying to take out a CD, you'd get what? Point zero one percent, you know. Yeah, it wasn't worth it. Yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't just wasn't worth it. Cash, and we we refer to those as cash products. And and while it's not cash money in your hand, it's something that has essentially no risk. You know, if you put a certain amount of money in it, based off of how long you agree to keep it there, you're going to get a certain type of return. And up until here re- recently, it wasn't even worth your trip to the bank. It wasn't worth the trouble to fill out the paperwork. Uh, in order to get it, you you could you know I'm gonna get ten bucks off of it. Yay! I'm gonna take the time out of my day to go sign up for that and tie my money up on top of it. So you know that that we may return to a world where that becomes uh, somewhat attractive. But we also have to remember this: cash rates will always be lower than inflation. So it's still doing the same thing for you that it did for you a year ago. You know, if inflation is at six percent or seven percent, and they're paying you three or four. Well, you're still trailing what inflation is, so over time you're still losing the same amount of purchasing power as what you did a year, year and a half ago. It's still doing the same thing for you, but it does make you feel a little bit better that you're getting something on your cash. In that, return. That's the most important thing, Phil. I feel got a better, feel better. Better. You know, that's true, though. That's it what is. drives the economy. How do you feel? It's, well, that's the thing. When, when there's stock markets rising and your 401k plan is going up, it's not like you can touch that anyway. And you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s. you gotta, you got to wait a little while, right? Right. But it still makes you feel better. So you have more confidence going by a car or a house. Exactly, it does, and even though exactly right, even though that's not money you're going to to go get, it makes you more confident. And a confident consumer spends money, and if you spend money, it's it's movement throughout the economy. And that consumer confidence report, in large part, sometimes is driven by 401k balances and what's my 401k look like, and you know, of course, my wage growth and what's my bank account look like as well. But even if it's not money you're going to get to, it makes you feel a little bit better if that if that uh, savings, that four hundred one k savings, or, or what, however, whatever vehicle you're using to save money, looks much higher than what it did last quarter. It just makes you feel better, and you are more likely to spend money. Kind of like when the Steelers are good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm more likely to buy a Steeler T-shirt when they're yeah. good than when, they're, than when they're bad. Phil, how I do we lost a Steeler T-shirt in a while? <laughs> how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day, sir.